a brief intro to this episode, which I've never aired before. I recorded this uh, interview with Seymour Wishman, who was the president of First Run Features, a distribution company of independent films, art films. I never aired it because Seymour reluctantly agreed to do this interview, a very reticent subject. He did come out. I was able to have a really nice conversation with him, but his volume and um, lack of, of enthusiasm over being interviewed came through, and I just felt that it wasn't probably going to be very effective putting it out in the world. But he was a warm and intelligent and clearly a very special human being who had lived a very special life. And I have no hesitation putting this out in the world now for those of you who may not have been familiar with Seymour and his impact in independent film. And just his life in general, his time as a civil rights attorney and an author and a family man and so much more. Anyway... I am putting this uh, interview out into the world as my uh, tip of the hat and um, appreciation of all that he did in his lifetime. Seymour died in his home in Bridgewater, Connecticut on January 29th at the age of 79. I wanted to also just apologize for the fact that I talk as much as I do in this interview, more than even usual probably trying to compensate for Seymour's reticence in being interviewed. However, if you can forgive that, I think you'll still appreciate and enjoy my conversation with Seymour Wishman. May he rest in peace. It's really about the history of, of film, and, or at least independent and art film. And, okay. and you're, part of, you're very much part of that history, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. you feel old, right? No, no, no. No, I am. A, yeah. No, no. For what I'm doing, this is to talk to somebody who's been around a while in the industry. It's it's a it's a gift. So, what is the I, su- what's the subject of this interview? Well, the subject is you. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to a lot of filmmakers, primarily, but I also bring, talk to a lot of industry people. And something that surfaced over the years I've been doing this is a or, sort of a, a bit of an oral history as well. So, you know, if I've spoken to you know, other people that have been, whether they're in the festival side of it or in the producing or distribution, you know, like yourself, uh, exhibition, the idea is that th- something emerges from on a collective level about the industry. So I think a lot of people, especially a, I, a lot of people in the film community listen to this podcast because they really have obviously a vested interest in in hearing your story and hearing other stories like that so so i, I don't have like a an agenda really you know it's i know it's kind of sounds a little fishy but <laughs> i like to talk to people that have a lived a life too and so to me it's interesting that you you know just by the pictures on your wall seymour whether it's you know at the white house or that i know first run has has a really interesting history in of itself yeah, and just uh, to get some of that background, I think would be really great to hear about that. Um, okay, ask me what you like. All right, and, you know, don't worry about how long your answers are. <laughs> I love guests that, that give long answers, so don't worry about saying too much. So, okay, well, let's let's just go back a little bit. But even before First Run Features, I know from the little due diligence that I did that, in fact, you have a law background, Correct. You did you? Where'd you yes. grow up? Where did you grow up? By the way, I grew up in Newark. In Newark, yeah, I did. My dad grew up in Newark. Oh, really? Yeah. He went to Wee Quake High School. Did you? That the highlight of my career that you're asking about my career. I was the president of Wee Quake High School. Wait, can I, I? This doesn't have to be in the show. Can I ask your your age? Just because seventy five. Uh, okay, so my dad's older, so he would have been gone by the time you got there. But and, and Philip Roth would have been even older. So well, Roth was a couple of years older than I, right? Yeah, no, he. I think he was even older than my dad. So, what is it what, possible? Do you know what year you're? My dad. I'm sorry. He is eighty. He just turned eighty-one this summer, so he was born in thirty-six. So I guess around what's his name? Fifty-four. Bob Shartoff. Robert Shartoff. I, d- I didn't know him. Yeah, but um, I had skipped a lot, so I they, uh, I was. I was younger when I graduated high school, young, younger than when I graduated uh, 
I got both degrees, college and law school, in six years instead of seven. So I was very, I was young when I just, graduated law school. Did you grow up in a very academic household in the sense of your parents put no, a lot no, of no. emphasis on that? No, you no, were just no, gifted. No, no. Well, my parents were uh, both immigrants and uh, uh, had uh, very little education, the benefit of very little education. And, uh, and I grew up uh, 18 years uh, in Newark uh, in a tenement. Uh, mm -hmm. Uyghur poor. Mm -hmm. But even though they were immigrants and they didn't come from, they didn't have a lot of background with uh, or education themselves, sometimes that means that they want to make sure their children do have the best education they can possibly provide for oh, sure. them. And they wanted you to succeed. Oh, yeah, of course. And did you feel like that? I mean, what, what, how do you explain getting through and, and, and getting all those degrees and that being such a priority? No, education was always uh, okay. a very high priority. And, yeah. uh, always expected to ultimately go to college. And uh, and you end up getting your, I know your law degree at Rutgers, Rutgers, right, in New Jersey. So you right. were still staying, staying pretty close to home. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All right. So you got your law degree, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you went through a period where you were, that I guess was now in the 60s? I graduated oh. law school in 65. Wow, so the timing of that is... Well, it was uh, when the Vietnam War was uh, just heating up. But I was, at that point, uh, just turned 60... I uh, just turned 23. Unlike almost everyone else in my uh, class at law school was already 26, which was the cutoff date for to be drafted. So the first year out of law school, I clerked for a, a criminal trial judge, which gave me a deferment. And then the, uh, that brought me to 24. And I had several choices, but uh, what s seemed the most attractive to me was be to go to the Peace Corps as a legal advisor, which I did. And I wound up spending two years uh, in Peru and li lived in Lima working as a legal advisor. And then uh, I was 26 uh, and beyond the age of being drafted. And it certainly seemed clear to me that I would rather be in the Peace Corps than in a search and destroy mission in Vietnam, so that, that, that's why I chose that. But I've had a kind of checkered career. I've had uh, I've been lucky enough to have a number of uh, jobs that all seemed attractive to me and, and uh, that I enjoyed doing. When I came back, I worked on a treaty, uh, um, the first Intelsat treaty, uh, satellite treaty, where I worked for the, uh, the FCC. And then I, I uh, worked for a year as the chief hearing officer and uh, advisor to Bess Meyerson, who was the mm -hmm. head of the uh, Department of Consumer Affairs in New York. From there, I, I spent two years as a prosecutor in Essex County, which included Newark. Who were, and then after that, I uh, began doing criminal de defense work mm -hmm. and some civil rights work. I worked uh, with a law firm that uh, was the largest law firm handling anti-draft work, but also had a reputation of uh, being involved in civil rights cases. Uh, and uh, so I had an opportunity to work on the Chicago 7 appeal. The law firm represented Daniel Berrig Berrigan. I worked on... Uh, and then I handled the case for the ACLU to establish a a transcript in a case involving uh, a gay father who wanted uh, the visitation rights to his three kids. And that turned out to be uh, a, a very important case for me and a case that ultimately went to the Supreme Court to be uh, affirmed. Anyway, from there I worked in the White House for a year, came back, continued practicing on a much more <clears throat> part-time basis and focused more on my writing. I've written Several novels. I published, and, uh, yeah, four or five books. First one was a novel. Then there were two <clears throat> nonfiction books, and the next was a novel. One of the uh, the nonfiction books was called "Confessions of a Criminal Lawyer," which was an effort on my part to try to understand why I was spending so many so much effort handling cases for clients that uh, some of whom were monsters who had done monstrous things. Yeah, that, uh, your way of reconciling that. Reconciling it in your mind. Trying, well, trying to figure out why I was doing it. Yeah, I mean, I hated most of my clients. Sure, sure. Uh, so it seemed uh, odd behavior. Most of the criminal lawyers that I knew, 
uh, only did it for a couple of years. I did it for almost 18 years. 18? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. So you really had a full career as a lawyer and yeah. an author, yeah. published author. Yeah. And this was uh, until what time? I mean, did you see this? You figure during those years and that this was it. This was what you're going to be doing for your... I never thought of it like that. You never I, had I never the big plan. Long, long, long term. term I can... never had much uh, in life planning. Uh, and none of my jobs were uh, very well planned or thought through or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, in the middle of uh, Confessions of a Criminal Lawyer, uh, which really was an effort to try to describe what it was like to be a somewhat typical criminal lawyer handling uh, your your typical murderer and rapists rather than celebrities. By the middle of the book, I thought it would uh, I should try to offer something uh, mm -hmm. to explain my behavior to the reader, if not to myself. And the best I could come up with was a, an anecdote in 1952 where I was... I guess I was about 10 years old at the time, and I was sitting around the kitchen table with my brother, who was three years older than I, and my parents. And I was asking uh, why they were going to electrocute the Rosenbergs. And my brother suggested it was because of uh, the McCarthy uh, hysteria that was then going on. And my mother thought, no, it was probably the start of another pogrom, which she was familiar with from growing up in Poland and my father said uh, lower your voices the windows are open and somehow I thought that story uh, might suggest something to do with the kind of atmosphere I grew up in but uh, it was in a very early age that I, uh, I, I felt a, uh, a real kind of commitment to uh, civil rights or lefty sort of things Do you see the, the, the connection between Civil rights work and defending criminals. Yeah. Do you see the yeah. the the point of it yeah. and the connection, right? Yeah. I certainly Civil liberties. That is a connection between uh, that background and my interest in first run features. I didn't start first run features. Right. Uh, that began in 1979. It was 1983 when uh, I was asked if I could uh, possibly uh, help with this company that was in, at that point in terrible trouble financially. Mm -hmm. And I was in the middle of a book, and I thought that this would be a good balance for me. I found, uh, at that point, writing full-time, uh, not terribly productive. I couldn't write more than three, four hours, and I spend the rest of the, the time the following day on doing the kind of dribble I wrote after those three, four hours. And also lonely. So, uh, right. so when I got involved with First Run, I, uh, I had uh, people talking to me, which was, uh, it's true, they were creditors screaming for their money, but at least they saw people were talking to me. So uh, that's how I got involved. <laughs> right. It was a social involved. job. Right. Well, one thing I got to ask before we move into the First Run chapter, which is primarily what we'll talk about, but, right. and that is a couple of things. One is you did bury a lead a little bit by saying I'd spent a year at the White House, so i got to ask a little bit about that. First of all, who's administrator? Was it, would that be Nixon already? No, no, Carter. Carter? Oh, right, Carter. So it was already after. So it was in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. Right. Okay. So did you get time with the guy? Did, I did you get time with the guy? With Jimmy? Did I get time? Did I, yeah. I had, Share peanuts? Not much, but... Uh, what, what was he like? No, I, I didn't have enough time to, to spend a personal... Uh, to come to a, any kind of personal opinion of me. But you were was, you were a legal counsel, or no? I was a deputy well, assistant to the president, which was a uh, uh, relative. Uh, it was a high level job. <laughs> and, and to this day, right? You're it gives you sort of a, a by default you get invited to the Christmas party. Is that what you did? You no, did I, uh, I got invited to okay. the Christmas party. I'm sorry, I'm my, speaking. Uh, my wife, who's had a very distinguished career in publishing, uh, had uh, started a company called I Village. Oh, yeah. It became enormously successful. Yeah, but huge. part of it uh, gave her an opportunity to interview uh, both Gore and, uh, and Bush when they were r running against each other. And uh, after Bush won, he invited uh, my, my wife to the White House for several meetings mm -hmm. and then invited her and her spouse to, to the Christmas party, and I was the spouse. So that's how I got to the Christmas party. I see. But I went to the Christmas party when Carter was there. 
Sure. So, but in any event, in any event, that, um, that was a long time ago already. Very true. But I had very fond memories of of him as a president. Still. Well, I had terrific memories. Of, yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was unbelievable to be at the uh, in the White House to have. To give my parents a tour of the White House and uh, a photograph of them oh. standing in front of the uh, Oval Office uh, door. These immigrants. It's, it's kind of oh, yeah, hard to imagine what uh, what their reaction was. They didn't tell you? No. Really? I'm sure they told other people, but they, they didn't tell me. <laughs> they didn't want to get to your head. Or... Right. Yeah. Oh, so when did you meet your wife? I'm not going to spend too much time on that part. I'm curious to know if... There is a connection between her and your publishing career and your and your writing. No, there was no connection. Okay, there, yeah. right. it was a, a blind date set uh, set up by a mutual friend. Okay, actually, uh, Delia Ephron, who wrote a book. Oh, I know wrote, who she wrote a play. Nora's her, sister. Nora, One right, of so, Nora's sisters, on, uh, I should say. You got mail, something like that. So this was somewhat similar to that. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Okay. So you you did the present. All right. So and then. Uh, Meanwhile, you're, so you're going between writing and uh, working as a, a criminal defender. Right. Thank you. Okay. And, <laughs> and trying to reason that. And so the, is that book, by the way, is that, that you said it was called uh, The li- Confessions of Confession, a Criminal Lawyer. It's a great right? title, Confessions of a Criminal. Yeah. Is that still available? Is well, actually, can people... that, uh, the three, of, three of my books just recently came out as e-books and audio books. Oh, uh, is that right? Yeah. Did you, you didn't do the audio no, the, oh. no I, not only did I not do it, I never listened to it. It's, uh, <laughs> should, I, should, I should. Is it? Do they just hire some audio book actor, did. or do uh, they hire yeah. real? Yeah, no, but it's available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever so, right. uh, uh, online. Who was running first run when they reached out to you? Was Fran Spielman was Fran the, Spielman. You know, the woman who started it. Fran Spielman. And that was the main reason I got involved with it. She was an older woman who uh, had, okay. had a lot of experience in the film business and distribution, although not. Uh, in running a business uh, but anyway I became uh, very attached to Fran and uh, she started it in 1979 78, 79 yeah. was it, it started as a as a co- film collective is that what it was no, not like really. a, it, it okay was I got misheard it as a, a regular C corporation as a profit making corporation although okay. it really hadn't made a co- uh, profit but uh, it started because there were like six independent filmmakers of Documentaries who had convinced Fran to come out of a, a uh, an early retirement. She had worked for the New Yorker and uh, several other companies that were involved with distribution as the booker. So anyway, they uh, they Are you convinced the New Yorker to, uh, films. Yeah, Is that what you mean? Okay, right, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, um, they were uh, American independent filmmakers, and it was started with the with the, the the notion that it was uh, to be in American independent films, uh, not necessarily documentaries, but they were initially all documentaries. Mm-hmm. And um, so, when I got involved with it, uh, they had taken on a film called Wild Style, which was the first. Charlie movie. Ahern, of course, exactly. He's been on the show several times. Oh, is that right? I, well, we're friends. I mean, yeah. Oh, very fond of Charlie. Yeah, he's a sweet guy. In fact, I think that's one of his, that's his book here. On, I didn't even look. Oh, yeah, there it is. I got to get a copy of that. It's a, I've seen. The second gotta, I was at and, Betty Gordon's. Ask Charlie, not me. That's the only. No, I wasn't going to ask you that. I was. I'm not going to ask you that. But I was. I was at Betty Gordon's the other day. Oh, really? She she did. It. Yeah, I'm, I'm not fooling around. I told you. <laughs> I, I see, I got it. No, no, but uh, and and she had a copy as well. It's a great. It's uh, anyway. He so you know they come from the same generation, of course. At the downtown so this well, charlie had done this film on uh, a wild style that right. uh fran had booked uh at what at the embassy theater on broadway which no longer exists mm-hmm. it was around 46th street broadway i think and it did incredible business boffo business and uh, it was running there for m- months and so a sub distributor came to fran and said look if uh you you give me the right to distribute uh, the film in the New York, greater New York area. I'll open it in 35 cities, uh, and all you have to do is supply the 35 millimeter prints. Mm-hmm. To, and uh, this seemed irresistible to Fran uh, and to the other people who were involved with First Run at the time. So she went, uh, she then made 35, 35 millimeter prints at an enormous expense. Right. Duart? 
Yes, two artists handle it. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the sub distributor placed it in uh, like 35 theaters. Oh, okay. And no one came. <laughs> Gosh. So the result was the, uh, the first run was an enormous debt. To, uh, to do art that hurts and to others because she did uh, they did advertising too right and that's when I first got involved because when I got involved it looked like the company was going to go out of business and uh, I remember having a meeting with uh, I took Fran with me and they had a meeting with uh, Erwin Young who was the r- running uh, do art at the time and uh, told him that we simply could not pay him he would have to spread out the opportunity to pay over the next year or so uh, I have to say, he, Erwin was uh, generous in allowing the, uh, those kind of terms. He was not that generous in the sense that he didn't uh, charge less. I understand. And I also told him that uh, I would walk away from the company and would go out of business and he would have no chance of getting any money. So, so, so some money so or... Was wise yeah, uh, right. Yeah. And at that point, uh, I had heard about this documentary that had been made in England about uh, some kids who were interviewed at the age of seven and then again at 14, 21, mm. and 28. And, it, and that there was a film that this guy Michael Apted had directed called 28 Up that sounded really interesting to me. Uh, although I have to confess, uh, I hadn't heard of Apted and I didn't know anything about this other than the fact that this was not an American film and nor was it really an independent film. Because it was made by BBC. Granada Television. Oh, Granada, Granada, right, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so I approached Granada and they said, well, maybe we should try taking it out. And they said, well, the film is really about um, uh, the British education system, and why would Americans care about that? And I said, well, I didn't think they would, but I thought maybe they'd be interested in seeing kids growing up, and maybe they would identify yeah. with them or uh, think that it has something to do with their kids or whatever. And, they, and Granada said, look, we've already spent so much money on this, we're not going to spend any more money on it. And I tried to say that, no, the, the point would be maybe we would pay them if we had any success with it. So, <laughs> so they said, all right. And uh, it uh, it ran for a year. I remember going to it. Oh, really? Tw- yeah, I, I, 28 Up changed my life. I mean, it's one of those films that it was just so... Yeah, the hook was just undeniably... You tr- identify with it, right. Well, yeah, I was probably around that age. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what it is? I've always been exactly seven years behind that generation, those those particular those people kids, yeah. that grew up with, you know, the, the series who are now coming into the... who are now in their 60s. Yeah. So I was always exactly seven years behind. Yeah. So you were the one that is essentially responsible for bringing that series to the U.S. is what you're... Right. Uh, although it wasn't an American independent film, it no. was enormously successful and yeah. with very little advertising that was necessary because of the word of mouth of it. So uh, there was a, a lot of revenue that came in that really allowed us to pay off a lot of the debts. And uh, do you mind if I can I turn that off for a few minutes? Is that going to yeah, be uncomfortable probably, for you? I ought to do it though. Okay, I apologize. It's just starting. It gets sometimes it come, kicks in and it. I'm wondering how loud that's going to be, but. I don't want you to be uncomfortable either, so... Yeah, that's great. There might now be a distinct change in <laughs> the background, but it's okay. Again, that's not so what it's... So there's also about. an opportunity to uh, to meet with uh, Michael Apted, who turned out to be... In, yeah. Uh, very gracious and uh, and generous in his time and his help on the film. And uh, I remember having lunch with him, and then I remember having lunch at, with him again at, when he finished 56 Up!, and yeah, sat across from each other, and all I could think of is he looks so much older. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> yeah. but you had at age, of course. No, well, you know, I can only say that I, I interview. I think I, I was here that day, probably because uh, I remember I interviewing. Him. Was for maybe the first time I was in the office, and I think it's the same day I may have met you the first time because I was invited to do the interview. I did it here somewhere, here, and with uh, maybe even in your in this room. Of, I, uh, I interviewed Michael. Michael Apted, oh, yeah, really? for 56 yeah. Up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so oh, that's great. And uh, so I was able to take uh, some of the money uh, from 28 Up and give it to I see. this other filmmaker who had just almost finished 
this film that he had been working on for like Can I guess? five years. Yeah, go ahead, you guess. You're going to say Ross McElwee. Yeah, right. <laughs> just can see. You knew this. Uh, that's I, a I, guess. I, he had I, just finished I uh, just know, March. I just know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it did come up. But, uh, I also interviewed Ross here too. Oh, is that right? But it, it was after. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was after uh, photographic memory. Oh, photographic memory. Yeah. So That's a more recent one. So those were probably. Uh, you know, I don't want to suggest, but those were two, like you know, just unbelievable opportunities to for me. Not just doing it for the show, but also just personally, to. Uh, you know, to to be talking to these two guys who's yeah. made films that I re, you know revered. So yeah. yeah, well, Michael Apton and Ross McAvoy were two of our most successful filmmakers. Yeah, and also uh, Sherman's March ran for like eight months uh, at the Bleecker Street Theater. So that was again a very successful film, uh, and that allowed us to uh, to get on our feet and uh, mm-hmm. pay do art. Ultimately. And they do work, right? <laughs> and get out of the, out of the, uh, uh, out of the black, right? To be uh, hounded by our creditors. Yes. You're able to kind of <laughs> right. settle all those deals finally. Right. So and so that would have been roughly in the already. Were, it must be probably around eighty six, eighty five. Oh, okay. Like yeah. yeah. This is a, a kind of interesting time too, because uh, right. I mean, what was going on with the the industry right, right beginning around that time too, was there was an explosion around that time in the mid '80s or so, right? Starting or maybe mid to late '80s. Of, well, it's just an explosion what? of like independent film, and and other all of a sudden all the big majors had started opening these independent film, right? Divisions, right? Did that have did that have, did that play much of a uh, role, or did that impact the way you guys were doing business here? Uh, right then. Not, not really. There's a uh, a, a variety, uh, a page I, I cut out of Variety that's uh, in, the, in our reception room, mm-hmm. uh, uh, listing ten top independent film uh, distributors, and the first run is the only one that still survives. They're all gone. Yeah. yeah they're all gone. <laughs> now, the difference was that um, um, I felt very committed to the idea of uh, independent films that uh, deal with social political issues mm-hmm. uh, uh, and I still do and uh, and I was able to resist trying to to explode into some much bigger company uh, I understand that uh, and so that was usually a- the, these other companies went out of business uh, soon after having a big hit because <laughs> then they thought that is all they could parlay that into uh, something bigger and, right and it's, t- it's a tough business it's they- very tough to predict they, At least for me. Some of them grew too fast, maybe, or yeah. right, and the market wasn't really able to bear that. And yeah. but you saw like a niche, maybe, where you guys could yeah. fit in and, and yeah. create something over also important and, and lasting. You mentioned the Variety article. There's another article that Judith sent to me. This making going back a few years before this, but you were wasn't first run the uh, the focus of a investigation or something of, of yeah, like yeah, like that's, that's yeah, by that's who what, what what by the white house by the reagan white house no it Which was one? uh it was the uh i guess it was the i guess it was the fbi that was conducting an investigation okay. uh, that and they were uh, doing a series of wiretaps this was during the uh the period where uh the united states was involved in several Civil wars, or uh, in right. Central America, mm-hmm. El Salvador, and Nicaragua, and there was a, a uh, an organization in the United States called CISPIS, which was uh, a kind of lefty organization uh, that was committed to uh, Central American uh, issues and support. Mm-hmm. And we had uh, a number of uh, films that would be of interest to that audience, and they would get in touch with us, and I would give them or rent them I can't remember uh, mm-hmm. our films mm-hmm. and then I got a call from uh, USA Today asking me how do you feel about being wiretapped and <laughs> I asked them what they were talking about they <laughs> said well there was a freedom of information uh, suit that was brought Oh, and it was revealed that CISPIS was uh, being wiretapped and there were conversations between them and, and uh, First Run and, and then and me and the truth was when I was um, still 
practicing law, uh, we had the largest uh, law firm that was uh, supportive of anti-draft uh, uh, efforts or mm -hmm. resistance. And the assumption was that we were always being wiretapped, and I never thought much about it because I didn't think there was very much <laughs> that, that was worth eavesdropping. Uh, uh, but so when, I, when USA Today asked me, how do you feel about we, being wiretapped, I felt compelled to say uh, I was outraged. <laughs> Did you were you like or were you proud? Point. Were you proud of it? I wasn't proud of it. I, okay. I, I mean, I, I, frankly, I didn't. In retrospect, it. in retrospect, was I? But proud does it a point of pride that I don't know? Maybe that that you I'm know. I'm proud. I have a, a daughter who seems like a nice kid. That's I mean, a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> have, am I proud of being wiretapped? No. Well, no, not being wiretapped, but you know, maybe <laughs> uh, just that you could have been. I mean, the government at the time was. You know, it sounds kind of like a paranoid level of paranoia and also corrupt on a certain level to yeah. be wiretapping yeah. businesses like this yeah. like what were they afraid of right. and you know so i could see you, there might be a little bit of pride that that maybe that a little distribution company in new york city relatively small distribution company making art films or distributing art films could be a point of of anxiety or fear for the government i mean i could see that maybe there's a little pride in well, I, in, frankly, in, I didn't with think all the of distance of time, of, I didn't think of it in terms of pride. But uh, Got it. I, uh, and if I if I thought it, uh, about it, I guess uh, more seriously, I guess I would have really been outraged. But I felt uh, when I said that I was outraged, I felt like I felt uh, that it was politically correct that I had an obligation to say that I, was, say. Out, I was outraged. <laughs> so the next day, USA Today published uh, an article about the wiretapping and quoted me of being out, outraged. Mm -hmm. The following day, uh, USA Today uh, called me and asked if I would be willing to write a, an op-ed piece about my outrage. And I had written a couple of uh, several uh, op-ed pieces for the Times when I was uh, peddling some of my books. Or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I, I, uh, they said 500 words. I thought that would be easy. So I wrote a, a, uh, an op-ed piece where I talked. Basically, I was making fun of the process of being wiretapped, where I, uh, I try to explain that we, in the film business, when we talk about bombs, we're not talking about exploding something. Uh, we're talking about not doing well at the box office. Or we're talking about hits. We're not talking about killing anybody. Uh, right. Things like that. Mm -hmm. So as it turned, and they published that op-ed piece. And as it so turned, it was a little tongue-in-cheek. Well, it was clever. Anyway. I was being, yes, yeah. I was being sarcastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, the... The next day or so, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who was the editor-in-chief of uh, Penthouse, which I used to write essays, legal essays for Penthouse. And, oh, okay. and I told him about my, this article that I just written, this 500-word article for USA Today about my outrage. He asked if I'd be willing to write a 1,500-word essay about my outrage. Mm -hmm. So I did. And so that got, that got published as well. So that's the history of my outrage about being wired. Oh, because I, I remember very dis very different letters to Penthouse that I read. I, I you know, sure. Yeah, they usually. I had a very big uh, pass along in prisons of my Penthouse uh, article. Oh, a pass along. Well, they, one Meaning? prisoner would pass it to another. Oh, okay. Because of the, I suspect because it was more of the dirty pictures than it was about my legal. Are you sure? You, well, no, there's no proof had, either way. So. Well, no, I would sometimes get calls actually uh, asking uh, for me to defend them, and I would try to explain that I'm not in the legal. The, the, the defense lawyer business anymore. I see. <laughs> oh, right. That's right. Hey, so you still, or could you, you, you ha when was the last time you practiced? Any... I've tried a case in over 30 years. Okay. Do you ever miss it? I do. Uh -huh. Actually, I do. I, I enjoyed uh, trying cases. I miss it, for example, when, uh, when Trump got elected. It was the first time that I seriously missed it because uh, that was a serious outrage in mm -hmm. my mind. And uh, Real I, outrage. That was real outrage. Yeah, right? not the... And that was a feeling that, uh, gee, I wish I were in a position to maybe do something. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, trying cases, actually... Uh, I, one of the things appealing about criminal law, at least, was that uh, criminal law is about the easiest uh, area of the law in terms of uh, the, the law itself. But what was hard was learning over a period of time the, uh, the actual... 
performance in a courtroom, uh, the technique of doing it. Sure. That, that took some experience, and that, uh, at this point, I'm convinced I, uh, I would not be able to do. Mm -hmm. so. uh, what about at the time when you were in the, you know, sort of in the real thick of it, yeah. and you were in front of uh, juries, and, yes. right? I mean, or yeah, no, even, I tried a lot of juries in front of a judge. Yeah. I, you, there is some performance to it, correct? Is that where you're? Yes. I, right. And I how was it? Contempt quite a bit. You did? Oh, sure. Oh. See, you're holding back all these. Anyway, but but I know I noticed on the same. I also tried a lot of cases in front of juries, and one of my, and my one of my books is called Anatomy of a Jury, which you could also get on uh, the ebook, uh, uh, ebook or sorry. audio. Right. I'm trying to find out who might have read that because he Seymour didn't read the. Oh, oh, Judith, our mutual friend, is here. In that article, is it isn't Ron Kuby quoted? In the one about uh, first run being among the among the wiretapped, not your the one, you, not the op-ed piece you wrote, but the one that was in um, the one was USA, USA Today? Today. I'm thinking, is that the one you sent me? I thought Ron Kuby was, who is of course you know one of the most he worked with the consular and maybe some of the most famous. Uh, I doubt defend it. I, think he worked, I, I actually tried cases uh, with consular for consular, but that, uh, and he came in after that. I think. Okay, his but, daughters went to my the summer camp. Yeah. yeah. That Sarah and Emily Kunstler, yeah, yeah, his daughters. No, Kunstler, Kunstler, Kanoy, and Morty Stavis, three old okay. lefty lawyers, yeah, started a, a organization called the Constitutional Law Center, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this was years ago. Morty Stavis uh, was uh, the partner to my law firm. That was the main reason I joined his law firm. Uh, and Kunstler used to try the cases. And then Stavis would handle the appeals. And so I, that's how I worked on the Chicago 7 appeal. Oh, right, right, with, of course. With Stavis. Mm -hmm. uh, Kanoi was a professor of mine at law school and also was a client of ours. So, uh, and uh, they're all dead now. So. <laughs> that's a, yeah. Well, that does, that does sort of happen. There is a, a pattern, I guess, because, you know, like you were describing before, once you got, once you were running first run and you could see the types of documentaries primarily, right, because you mentioned uh, a, a certain level of commitment to social, social political, social -political documentaries, documentaries right. pro, you know, maybe uh, progressive minded filmmakers, that type of things, right? Yeah. Although I mean, even 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 in their own ways, Michael Apted was was doing something enormously. So I mean, he I think you know really had an impact on the way we we look at at education here, for yeah. instance, and class. Never, I mean, I don't know what the impact really was in the UK, where it really needed to be make a difference, and you know, mm -hmm. especially during the Thatcher years, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, I could imagine that Michael Apted was like a. Th like a thorn in Thatcher's foot or something, a little. He also has a little. become enormously successful in Hollywood. He yeah, know. well, yeah, he was making. He directed James Bond movies That's and right. yeah, all sorts of things, yeah. of course, throughout. No, but my but it, uh, my primary interest in uh, in first run has been all along mm -hmm. films that I thought uh, were uh, involved with uh, social political issues that actually I cared about. We're about to open a film next week. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know when you're going to broadcast this, but uh, this would be uh, mm -hmm. actually Friday, called Co Company Town. Company Town. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is about uh, the Koch brothers uh, poisoning a, a town in Arkansas. I mean, there's the New York State Ballet is financed in part by the Koch brothers in a theater I know. the Koch yeah. Theater. But, uh, yeah, which is all very nice in New York, but in the meantime, they're poisoning people in Arkansas. Well, they're industrialists, right? After all, they're they're, they're they make. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you got, but you got to assume that yeah. some industrialists aren't uh, killers, or do you? Uh, no, no, I don't think of them as killers. It's true, but I mean, making I especially. Do. I mean, I, I, chemical companies and. No, I mean, I think that if you're responsible for a company that's uh, poisoning a town, I think... Yeah, uh, that makes you a killer. That makes you a killer. I agree. Yeah. No need to mince words. Right. I agree I agree with that. Right. Sure. So, Company Town. Yes. Okay. So, we'll, we'll look out for Company Town. No, but we've had that's... a lot of social political issue films that right. uh, deal, uh, deal with civil rights. We have a very large collection of films uh, dealing... Uh, with topics that would be of particular interest to gay uh, uh, mm -hmm. lesbian audiences, mm -hmm. uh, 
documentaries like um, before before Stonewall, mm-hmm. after Stonewall. We had another film called Stonewall. We, uh, the Stonewall trilogy, as it's sometimes known. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we have a very large collection, but not the largest in this country, dealing with the Holocaust. Uh, that uh, would be a particular interest to uh, Jewish audiences. Sure, sure, sure. Feminist issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like that. How, how active were you in the early days when this was still a relatively new operation for you? I mean, were you really hands-on at the time? I know you had a hire, you hired or there were programmers here who... I don't know what you mean who, by hands-on. Oh, I mean like in terms of cho- which projects you chose, which you're going to distribute. Well, ultimately, I, I made I mean, a final decision about any projects yeah. that we took on. Okay. Is, but that, you, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. 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 Or do, I, I mean, no, what is the... Chem- that, what's I was, that... Uh, I, I was... Um, because of the case I was just telling, I told you about earlier, uh-huh. uh, involving the ACLU's uh, um, the, ca- the case dealing with a gay father mm-hmm. uh, wanting visitation rights to his kids. I, just visitation, I, not custody. That's right. It was just visitation. But my client turns out was also the uh, uh, the head of the National Gay Task Force, which had, early on was one of the uh, the first uh, organizations that was involved with uh, gay issues, and the result was that I was an honorary member of the National Gay Task Force. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. That, see, I detect a point of pride. So, And, and no pun intended oh, no, no, with the I word was, pride. Yeah, no, no. Just regular pride. A little yeah, gay, no, pr- yeah, pr- gay I pride. Proud, I was proud to be a member yeah, of that. Yeah, gay sure. pride. Right. Sure, sure. There you go. I can understand that. I would, too. But I, I remember do, marching in the pride parade several times and feeling that was great. I enjoyed that. So yeah, but we have a, uh, a film uh, after Stonewall that has uh, mm-hmm. a woman draped in an American flag leading the uh, gay pride parade. Mm-hmm. I also got a call oh. from the uh, from a lawyer who uh, claimed that I outed that woman and wanted some kind of settlement. Did I ever tell you this truth? I said, "How could you? How could we have outed her? She was leading the gay." Bride parade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She says, "Well, she was a police officer, and no one in the police department knew that she was gay." I see. Uh, I said, "What is it? Why are you calling me?" He said, uh, "We wanted some kind of settlement, and we, we gave him some uh, some money." Really? Yeah. Just easier. It had a lot of. Uh, a lot I got of a call once from a lawyer. We were talking about uh, the Up series. I got a call from a lawyer. He says, uh, "I'm a lawyer uh, from uh, Hollywood." He said, "Good." He said, uh, making Whoopi is mine. I said, I assume you didn't call me to boast. Why are you telling me this? He said, because uh, in the background of uh, one of the Up series, uh, there was a couple getting married, and the radio was playing making Whoopi. More than a few seconds or something. I said, so? He says, well, you never got the rights to that. So first I argue that uh, it was... uh, uh, anyway, uh, ultimately we had to give him some money. You no, know, but it was playing in the background. It wasn't used on the s- soundtrack per se. And what it do they call about that? Making Whoopi. It was, no, uh, I understand. Uh, yes. Right. But, uh, again, this was Granada Television that that, that had uh, said that indemnified us for any uh, kind of. I think the line is, "She's so ambitious. She even sews, not sues." <laughs> See? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I should have called you for that. <laughs> yeah. I'm good with the writing the jokes, yeah. but I don't know about uh, yeah. I've although I've been on two juries, one civil case and one criminal, because I guess I'm just like the lawyers. They you know during the war years they can spot a. Uh, uh, did you uh, when when you served on the jury? Did you reach a verdict? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Because I think that uh, I, when I was doing the research for this anatomy of a jury, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I rarely, if ever, found. Uh, a, a juror who sat on the jury to the point of a verdict, reaching mm-hmm. a verdict, that didn't think it was one of the more important events in their lives. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Have you sat on a jury, Judy? I did once, and I reached a verdict, and yeah, it was one of the more interesting yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember very clearly the one one of the two cases, which was a, a, a woman who lived in a um, projects, in the projects, and she... You know, was walking down, the, constantly broken down. Yeah, everything broken down, and and walk, walking down the steps, and fell, and was really injured, rather, you know, severely. And uh, sh- and you know, with all the letters and everything, they had all the proof that they kept complaining uh, to the you know the management or whatever. 
and it wasn't taken care of, and they were suing the management. And uh, we not only th- and the management, the, the attorney was so arrogant. I mean, just thought he had it sewed up, you know. And uh, the attorney for for the buildings for the for the pro- for the big, you know, developer or whatever. So not only did we find her, you know, we 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 found in favor of her, but we went beyond. We recommended going way beyond what she what the you know they were asking for we we said can we ask for more money he said, yes you can so it was the the best it was the best it you I know you up, felt uh, my parents spoke yiddish in the house and i was 10 years old before i learned that shushkas wasn't uh yiddish for bastard it was the name of the landlord <laughs> i see <laughs> That's funny. Do you know he uh, Seymour uh, grew up uh, in in Newark and went to the same high school my dad went to. No way. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But my dad's uh, f- at least a good five years older. Yeah. That was the, one of the best high schools in the country. Is uh, that true? Weequake High School. Uh, it was famous for it, uh, and and maybe this actually contributed to uh, my mm-hmm. com- commitment to. Uh, civil rights kind of stuff. Uh, during the 50s, a number of uh, teachers were being purged around the country uh, because during the McCarthy period. Oh. And they wound up uh, teaching at Weequake High School. Oh, so I didn't know that. So you had some very good teachers there. It was also, when I went there, uh, and certainly when your father went there, it was predominantly Jewish. Yes. That had uh, homogeneous grouping so that uh, you would have uh, these advanced courses it was one of the earlier high schools in the country that segregated uh, the, the students so that uh, took a little slightly closer. What's that? Yeah, a little. Yeah, that's good. Sorry. So you, you had a really a, uh, very good advanced courses taught by very uh, good advanced teachers. Unfortunately, uh, there was um, a very quick uh, turnover when uh, uh, blacks started to move into the, uh, to the neighborhood. Yeah. And the, uh, the white people living in that weak wake section fled. I mean, my parents... White right? flight. Yeah, we were perhaps the last white family that I can think of that moved out of the tenement that we lived in for 18 years. Mm. But they only moved about four blocks away because there was a much bigger apartment that was the same price. So... Uh, but uh, and the uh, the fellow who became president of Week Wake High School after I was with, uh, which I must say I tried to help him, uh, was black, and that was a major uh, event. Mm-hmm. But it was only a few years after that, in '67, where they had the riots in Newark, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, I was sitting in Lima. I remember in the Peace Corps reading about these riots in, in Newark that I could had, had nothing to do with. As it turned out. My partner started a civil rights lawsuit against the city and against the, the, the two police officers who had arrested the taxi driver, put him in the back seat, handcuffed him, and by the time he reached the precinct, he, would, he was beaten to a pulp. This was, a, it was a, a, nine, a Section 1983 civil rights action. Five years later, it came to trial, and by that time I was back uh, in Newark, and so I tried that case in the, in the federal courts. Wow. Uh, Anyway, okay, so I can go on. There's a, no, there's a, amazing, amazing connections. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Must feel... And the, and the first uh, law offices that uh, I, private practice I had with Morty Stavis was in Newark as well. Mm-hmm. At 744 Broad Street, which uh, your father may uh, have been familiar with as, as the, uh, the the fanciest law, for, uh, law building, uh, National Newark and Essex building. Which, okay. Yeah. okay I'll, I'll, I'll definitely ask him to listen to this cuz maybe he can <laughs> okay. share some of those uh some memories there. I know that he definitely fell back in touch with after you know the advent of email and the internet a lot of weak wake people found each other and had to I know he attended a couple of reunions and stayed in touch oh, really? with some of the people after many years of course of not, you know. Uh, I mean, that was recently in the last 10, 10 15 what's years. Work, what type of work did he do? He was in magazine publishing. Oh, really? Yeah. 
How so? What did he uh, publish? Well, they had a, a different types of magazines. I guess their biggest sellers were these kind of teeny bopper magazines. Uh-huh. In, in you know, in the seventies into the eighties, they did very well because there were first of all there was no internet, there wasn't the competition, yeah. and there were just lots of of idols. Still, it was yeah. still an age with you know so many teen idols, and so. But they also did uh, soap opera magazines and sports magazines and uh, kind of magazines geared toward African American readers, like you know. I forget, but uh, See, my wife, uh, so she, uh, among been... other things, started a magazine called Family Life. Oh, uh, well, of course. She, uh, Not partners. Family Circle, but Family Life. No, Family Life. Right. Uh, became partners with John Wenner and then published that for about three years. Oh, was my that during the time of Rolling Stone? There yeah. Was... Oh, well, okay. Rolling Stone is started in the sixties. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, my wife had uh, she was the editor in chief of the uh, Book of the Month Club, and then she was the oh. pub- president and publisher of Doubleday. Then she started that. Then she started that magazine, and uh, mm-hmm. and then she started I Village, and did that for about eight years. She also had a. So she transitioned into into the internet age. Yes, successfully. She had the first women's. Uh, and then she's yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Enormously successful. With that that uh-huh. went public. Uh, and, uh, and she had a television show that was. Uh, on PBS for three years, that was more popular than uh, McNeil Lair and the and the one after it called the First Edition. Oh, what was her what was her show called? First Edition. First Edition. Yes, Nancy Evans was her name. Okay, yeah. and First Edition. That does sound familiar. But it was on PBS. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. That's right. But speaking of, te- I'm sorry to, and I don't mean to uh, to to speed over that too quickly or anything, but I'm also reminded you did a TV uh, appearance yourself of note. At one point, I'm going to guess it was in the '90s, I, I, with a very famous uh, TV host, of one of the biggest I, celebrity icons in the world, named Oprah. Uh, Oprah, is that yeah. what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, <laughs> after a while, gonna, a, you're holding the mug. <laughs> yeah. a clue. No, when I was uh, peddling my magazine, uh, my uh, books, I would, uh, I do, I used to do a lot of uh, television stuff. Okay. But uh, so, you, in fact, I was at in a, the early I days was at a dinner party. Okay. Uh, about 10 years ago, and I was seated next to a woman named uh, Jane Whitney. My first wife was Helen Whitney, who was a filmmaker, as a matter of fact. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. So I asked Jane if she was related. She says, no, no, I'm, actually I'm Jewish. This is an adopted name for her television show. And then I, by the end of the meal, I realized that uh, she used to have a show coming out of Philadelphia, uh, a talk show, where she would interview people. Oh. And Ten years earlier, I had been on her show, and neither of us had <laughs> That's remem- funny. <laughs> remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> and she still went, and she had the same name, obviously Jane Whitney, right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's funny because I, I don't think you'd ever, uh, you know, get onto Oprah. I mean, if you think about, it, I guess maybe this was early enough where she was still. I mean, no, she was probably national the, at that time. Well, I mean, no, no, but, this was national. But uh, this is the uh, uh, this is at the the the, the time of. Uh, I'm blocking on his name. What's the name? Thing? Phil Donahue? No, no. I'm talking about the defendant who uh, actually may be oh. coming out of jail now who uh, murdered his wife. And, well, there's so many. player. O.J. Simpson, excuse o. J. Simpson. me. Yeah, yeah. Right, he right. is getting out of jail. He was yeah. given parole. So, right. so, so this, is a, a, this is a film. This was a, a, uh-huh. a, a, a show about... Uh, so I was one of several uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, lawyers who were on the, on the show. Uh, I see. Oh, this was during the O.J. period? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So but that makes sense. Ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but yeah, they but threw everybody me out to Chicago and right. uh, then they, I was I was on the show with them. I had been to Chicago once before as part of the uh, Peace Corps mm-hmm. training, where I was placed in a with a family, uh, a, a Puerto Rican family of uh, eight kids that uh, the Peace Corps thought was going to help me uh, acculturate. The Peace Corps had a whole vocabulary. Uh, I was going to learn, help learn the culture and language. In fact, I was I became good friends with the father of these eight kids, and I taught him how to read a racing forum, and we went to the track and uh-huh. played pool at night. I, I, learned, I learned no Spanish, but I had that was the only other time. time I'd been in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the free association fi- uh, to part of the show. That's why right. it's fine. I, I will only say that it, that the my dad who was in magazine publishing, would get invited to all the press screenings and the uh, premieres, though, because uh, some of the magazines dabble. Well, they were involved in show business. So 
he constantly got invited and and so that's in a way was my what's the word my my uh sort of uh introduction to something exact w- way i wanted to put it but it was my introduction to you know really be- to film it really kind of started my my own journey because he often would take me you know my mom was maybe you know had to maybe she was home with my sister i don't know but but we, i remember going all the time to premieres through the 80s into the 90s you know until i was kind of too old to do it and he ended up stopped working but i went to so many films and it kind of created this uh you know sort of momentum for me i guess you know otherwise you could have been a doctor Son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Well, those I had those appointments, too. I don't know why the, the, the films took and the medicine didn't. But, but there are a lot of uh, people who are alive and healthy today that have me t- to thank that I didn't go into medicine. But <laughs> uh, All right. Listen, uh, it was really much more, of a, I, even better than I had hoped. It was great. And I, um, you know. I, I'm only sorry I wasn't a fly on the wall during some of those lunches with Radley now because... But I miss Radley terribly. I'm, I'm we, sure. We became really good friends. Yeah. And in fact, I spent uh, at least three or four occasions that he had a house in uh, Ez, which is near, uh, oh, in, in, in south of France, right. uh, near Cannes. Mm. And uh, he couldn't have been uh, more hospitable. And, uh, in fact, I took my wife and daughter there uh in the year when the uh in the millennium in the year 2000 a known f- porn- pornographer and we were able to he was not a pornographer and then Thank uh, you. uh we were able to watch the uh, the fireworks from nice uh, from his balcony i remember wow so that was a long time yeah. ago i miss him terribly we used to have uh dinner and lunch quite i know I know. I'm sorry for your, that. Yeah. That I am. I don't mean to make light of it and and i can tell you he was an artist uh, at the you know that, that we all miss, you know. Actually, when we took on his films, which had to be like twenty years ago, or so uh, there was a, uh, a big article in the Times, a big photograph of him and a description of uh, his career and some of his films. And coincidentally, our publicist happened to be in the office. Kelly. Kelly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I called her in so that Radley could thank her because this is the first time that. He was really treated seriously by the, uh, the Times, and I thought it would be a nice thing for him to do and for Kelly to do. And Kelly, uh, and he did, he thanked her, and Kelly said, uh, actually, I had really nothing to do with it. They called me, and uh, all I did was line it up. Hmm. And uh, it was the first time I had come across a publicist who would uh, not try to grab the, the kind of uh, right. credit credit where it wasn't due where, where, where it wasn't uh, due or whatever mm-hmm. and um, we've used her ever since yeah I and know. Radley it's, was very appreciative of, so it's uh, a it's that. a relationship that you don't see too often actually uh, since I, I've been you know had any kind of relationship with, with First Run Kelly's names were always at the at the top of every yeah. press release to the, from from the beginning to now yeah which is rare yeah, you don't no, see so that it's been what it must be like 20 years or so wow yeah. is that right well, I, wow. I don't know <laughs> it's been a long something time. like that a long like time a long, longer a long, than the typical time. yeah i agree well well thank you very much for for all well, your time today and it's been really thank you it's nice talking to you all right and and uh, uh maybe in another we'll do a part two someday <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> <I know. laughs> thanks again